Hello, everyone. Good day. Good morning. Good evening, according to your time zone. My name is Makia Majrashi, patient safety specialist at Saudi Patient Safety Center. You will be hearing a presentation from Mr. Hidden Haskell and Mr. Hussein Jeffrey. They will be speaking to us about lens on safety, an overview of patient engagement and patient empowerment. Mr. Hussein Jeffrey is the founding director of Ford Patient Alliance, a global patient alliance, and he has a very active in the field of patient safety and has been a former vice chair of ad both advisory group of WHO Patient for Patient Safety Program. Hussein has also founded Pakistan Patient Safety Initiative and has been working towards several patient safety initiatives. The government of Punjab and has also nominated him as a focal person for patient for patient safety and quality. And he also given the responsibility of developing patient safety and quality service in the healthcare sector of Punjab province. He is also experienced as a speaker and had a lot of resources and published several publications of international journals. He is working as generic counselor for generic disorders like leukemia, a chronic illness in Pakistan. He is a carer for his grandfather who suffered from dementia, founded as Heimer Pakistan, informally worked as advocate for patient-centered healthcare, and he recently joined the patient advocacy movement. And Helen Haskell, she is an American patient safety advocate with 20 years of experience. She is a published author who has worked in all aspects of patient safety across a wide range of settings. She is also a former of share co-chair of ad hoc advisory group of WHO patient for patient safety and led the patient and public working groups for WHO global challenge on medication safety and the global patient safety action plan. I think you will have a great time with our honored speakers. Let's start with Mrs. Helen. You, she will be the first speaker. Welcome on board. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to our webinar. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the um, some of the um, yes, so, so, some of the um, methods and and practices and tools that are available to um, patients and to providers. So these are our objectives for our our talk. Uh, illustrating a co-design approach with patients and family, the experience of patient engagement tools and methodology, um, best practices related to patient empowerment, and efforts by national and international organizations to empower and raise the patient voice. Um, Hussein will be addressing this part of it. And all of this talk really is recommendations to lower and middle income countries. Um, for model based on evidence and experience. Next slide, please. So why patient engagement? Why is it really needed? Well, parts of that are just obvious. The patient is the one person who crosses the entire healthcare system. They're the person who sees everything. Healthcare providers go in and out. Um, the patients have the entire experience. Um, and what happens to the patient? is what matters. If a patient doesn't have a good experience, it is not good health. Patients can contribute um, their knowledge of themselves and their family members, which is essential knowledge. Um, and above all, we sometimes joke and call it uh, provider engagement because patients usually are eager to be engaged. They are timid. They don't want to bother busy professionals. They don't know how to ask, but if you ask them, they will participate. And they can help. They can help to improve the system um, using their knowledge, what they've seen and what they've learned um, and how they have interacted. Next slide, please. So a few definitions. Um, sometimes it's confusing. People use these terms interchangeably. Patient engagement, patient empowerment and co-production are sometimes called co-design. Um, so these are some of the official uh, definitions. Patient engagement is simply strengthening the role 
of, of patients in using services, um, both as patients and throughout the healthcare system, um, right up to global policy. Patient empowerment more often is aimed at um, the, the services between patients and providers, but it, it also, one can be empowered in many directions. And finally, co-production, which is really, I think what is meant by all of these terms, co-production or co-design um, means partnership between health professionals and patients, accepting the patient as an equal partner. Um, we all, healthcare is, is a relationship. It can be good or bad. We co-produce all the time, whether we want to or not, but if it is not a partnership, it is not good co-production. Next slide, please. So this is a, a diagram of, of similar things, of those terms that I just used. So you empower the patient with information, you engage the patient as part of the team, and then together you co-produce not just that patient's care, but improvements in the system using feedback from patients and their, their contributions as to what could help. Next slide, please. So essentially, I see patient safety um, as a learning process. And we have what's called a learning institution where everyone learns from each other and it's a constant loop of feedback. So we start out before the patient enters the system, really before they enter treatment is, is what that means. Um, you have, you have um, systems and, and methods and tools that will help. So shared decision making, um, information about safety and quality, both in the facility and um, in general, preparing themselves for medical care, preparing them th themselves for the appointment and the conversation, and learning how to navigate the system, something people often don't know. Once they're in the system, there are a number of things, particularly if they're in the hospital, number of things that can be done to make patients more comfortable and more interactive. Family-centered rounds, that is having rounds and, and change of shift transitions at the bedside instead of off in some faraway place. Um, giving them access to medical records. This is so the patient can know what's going on, all of these things. Um, practicing good medication safety, doing medication reconciliation with the patient, reviewing their medications with the patient, um, and then finally allowing families, giving them a process to escalate concerns if they need to. The next um, part of the process, which hopefully does not happen often, is if a patient is harmed. This is a learning experience, among many other things. Um, so it's a rupture in the relationship between patient and provider, but it needs to be dealt with in a healing fashion and in a way that people can learn from. So you need rapid investigation, um, apology and disclosure, um, aid for the patient who is um, likely injured and perhaps financially injured, certainly emotionally injured, and recommendations for change so that it doesn't happen again. And then from there, we proceed to patients and quality improvement. So patient advisory councils, patients on event reviews to, to find out what happened, patients involved in pa safety and quality committees in the hospital, um, and, and providing a way for patients to report safety concerns. We'll talk about all of these in the slides that follow. Next slide, please. So, this is um, an informed consent process from the Saudi Patient Cent Safety Center, which has um, excellent resources on its website, which is, I think, S spsc.sa.gov. I think that's right, or .gov.sa. Um, so before you sign a consent, um, there are a number of things a person should know. Uh, they should know Let's see if I can get this. Uh, you know why they are why they're being asked to undergo this treatment. Um, what are what are the common complications and risk of the treatment? Um, what comes afterwards? Um, what is their recovery going to be like? Which is something patients are often shocked by. 
um, and finally what they need to do, what they need to do next. And the other thing that is um, that I also recommend patients asking is what happens if I don't do this treatment? What happens if I do nothing? This talks about alternatives, but sometimes one of the alternatives is to wait and see. Next slide, please. So shared decision making, that informed consent is, is part of shared decision making, but shared decision making takes it a little further by presenting all the options that patients have um, and having a conversation that, um, you know, that allows the doctor and patient to, to discuss things and really decide together. Um, there are decision aids that are really helpful for many procedures. A source that I like is the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And down at the bottom, it's sort of overlapping with the logo, um, is the um, website for, for those decision aids, which just simply lay out the facts on different, different procedures and treatments and what, um, what alternatives might be. Next slide, please. So there's some of the benefits of shared decision making. Um, patients learn about their health and understand their health conditions. Um, they're, they're more capable of evaluating their options. They, they collaborate with their health provider. So the decision is something they feel is right for them. Um, they feel more trustful of the healthcare provider. And they're, so they're much more likely to follow through with their decision. Next slide, please. So other information that's important, it's not just about the treatment or the process um, or even the diagnosis. People will talk about that a little later, but diagnosis is part of this. People need to know how you arrived at the diagnosis, but they need to understand how this affects them. How many times has the procedure been performed in this facility? So they experience uh, how much experience do you have in this procedure? Uh, what are the complication rates? You know, going from from globally and nationally down to the institution and the and the provider, as well as how it relates to the patient. What is my risk um, considering my condition, my life situation, and what can I expect once I once I have done this procedure? Next slide, please. Um, patients need to be prepared even before going to a regular doctor's appointment, even before going to a checkup. They have questions. They need to, um, you know, they need to think about it in advance to write things down. These are a couple of little um, little tools that AHRQ at, in the U.S., which I work with a lot. They have a lot. Everything they have is free. Um, and they have a lot of very patient-oriented material. So this is just basically, you know, how to ask questions, how to um, write down your questions and what you're concerned about. Uh, one is for diagnosis and the other is simply a general appointment, but I think the diagnosis sheet can be used for anything. Frankly, I like it the best. Next slide, please. But patients need other tools and information. They need to know how to navigate the system. That's really important. And it's something that people almost never learn. They don't know who is who. Um, it's very hard when people are all dressed alike. You don't know who's coming into your room, who's giving you information. Providers need to repeat it every time they come in because everybody looks alike. That's my experience as a patient. Um, you, they need to tell you their role and what a person in their role does and what their name is and then why they are there. Um, patients need to keep a record. It's very helpful. Um, you know, who's been in to do what, um, what the vital signs are that have been reported, what their questions are, so they'll have them handy to ask. Um, and then they need to know who to call for what, especially if there is an emergency. Um, because the nurse is not always available. Other people can be called directly. Um, the reasoning behind their diagnosis and treatment is so important because if there has been miscommunication, then 
the diagnosis can be based on a misunderstanding. So this all needs to be sort of repeated and gone over to make sure that you're both on the same page. Patients need to know when they need to call for help. That's something people don't know. Uh, they need to know the danger signs to watch out for after an operation with a drug, what could go wrong. Um, and then they need to know what to do. They need some call who can come help them immediately. Next slide, please. Medication safety is critical throughout. You know, most of medicine really is medication. Um, there are a number of good tools for this. This is from the World Health Organization, Five Moments for Medication Safety. So starting, stop taking, adding, reviewing, and stopping a medication, the five critical moments in the medication journey. Um, patients need to there are questions that, that they can ask at each one. This little poster shows two questions for each one. We, there's actually a, um, a booklet that has five questions. And I was involved in, in creating this. And believe me, it was hard to even to get it down to five questions. Um, two was heroic on the part of WHO. There are many things that patients should know and should be told. Um, there's also an app. They can keep track of their medications in here. And these, these three technical booklets are very good, well-written um, volumes about uh, medication safety that you would find helpful, all free on the WHO website. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of a medication list. This is Patients for Patient Safety Ireland. It's on their website. They put it together for World Patient Safety Day last year. But just a way for patients to keep track of their medication so they know what they're taking and they can bring it to their provider. They know when to take it and what it's for. Next slide, please. Uh, access to medical records. I think is a critical component of patient safety and patient engagement. Um, in the U.S., starting at the bottom here, in, in the U.S., we have for the past oh, year and a half, I think, had complete access to our medical records um, really in almost real time in the patient portal. And I think people are finding it invaluable. You know what's going on. You can read your lab reports. You can... Um, Find out what your treatment is. If there are any mistakes, you can flag them. You can't write that in the record, but you can tell your provider. Um, and there are, al there are always a lot of mistakes. I always say communication is the hardest thing we do as humans. Um, and we don't do it very well, even though we think we do. Um, so it's really important to double check and double check. Um, the Open Notes group, which really was behind the, the access to medical records in the U.S., now has a process that they're working on called Our Notes, in which providers and patients work together um, to create the, the record of a visit. So it starts with patients sending in, you know, a, 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 an account of what they would like to, uh, to talk about, and then the notes are you know, generated during the visit and they both agree upon them, which is really helpful because a lot of errors happen from misunderstanding during that critical patient visit. Next slide, please. Um, making the patient part of the team in the hospital. So there are a couple of things that you can do to be sure that patients are always on the same page. Um, as their providers. You know, one, as I said earlier, is doing all the transitions at the bedside. So nurses change their shift at the bedside so that when they are reporting what's going on with that patient to the next nurse, the patient can hear and can, can chime in and add things or make corrections if needed. Um, and they know what their providers are thinking. Um, rounding, family-centered rounds at the bedside, um, I think is really an enormous uh, enormous benefit, both to doctors and patients. I, I work with a group that does it, the IPASS group, which also works on transitions in the US. And um, we have the patient speak first. So when the, when the 
when the doctors and nurses also come in and the trainees, everyone, the team comes into the bedside and the patient says how they, th the family member says how they think the patient is doing and, and what their questions are. And then the, the rounds proceed in light of that um, information. So it allows patients to understand their treatment better, to ask questions, um, to correct any misunderstandings that the doctors and nurses may have. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a checklist from the family centered rounds, but it's you know what the family would would tell them, you know how they're doing, sharing concerns, asking questions, um, and then they're left with the the plan of care, um, what to do if the child is getting better or worse. Um, next slide, please. So deteriorating patient, um, especially in the hospital, but this is not just the hospital. Um, patients deteriorate, you know, in every setting, right? Things happen, um, particularly with infections. So patients need to be educated about this. People, the public needs to be educated about this. What are the signs of a patient who's in trouble? People don't know. They don't want to seek help before they need to. Um, they're afraid of wasting the provider's time. So they need to know what are the signs of deterioration. If they're in the hospital, they need to be told what the machines do that the patient is attached to, how to read them. So how to know if they're, if the readings are off the chart. And then, you know, I like teaching people just basic communication techniques. Um, the Team Steps program, again by AHRQ in the US, has wonderful communication techniques. One of them that's helpful for patients is called SBAR, Situation, Background, um, Assessment, and Request. Um, and pa it teaches patients to and, and providers, you organize your thoughts and, and transmit the, the problem in a rapid and, and comprehensive way. Um, patients need rapid response teams. I am a huge fan of rapid response teams because I had a child who died in a hospital um, from failure to rescue. That is, he deteriorated and nobody understood what was going on. There was no rapid response team in those days. No one was called. Um, it was a needless death of a healthy child. That doesn't need to happen. Every hospital should have a rapid response team or a critical care nurse outreach. Nurses who go around and ask the nurses in the wards, is there a patient you're worried about? It checks up on patients who might have problems. Um, and then patients need to be able to call the rapid response team. Um, I'll talk about that in just one second. Next slide, please. So these are some signs of deteriorating patients. This is something that I put together for the International Society for Rapid Response Systems. And uh, it's just, it was, it's based on a nurse's um, assessment of things that can be seen without measuring. That is what the patient looks like and feels like. So you don't need vital signs. You don't need uh, lab values. This is something that anybody can look at and say, oh, this patient is in trouble. I should add, if you're interested in setting up a rapid response team, the International Society for Rapid Response Systems and their, their um, web pages on the prior slide. Um, they do have free membership for one year for people from low and middle income countries and they have mentorship so they can help you in setting up a rapid response system if you're interested. Next slide, please. Um, these are just two, two examples of patient activated rapid response. So family escalation of care, call for concern. Um, this is a British program. Um, it's a sort of traditional patient activated rapid response that is um, integrated with a um, critical care nurse outreach. Um, in the hospital. And then Ryan's rule in Australia, which is it's more comprehensive, it can be triggered from anywhere. If, um, if patients feel they are not, or family members feel they are not getting um, the proper response. And there's little Ryan for whom it is named, um, who also died from failure to rescue. Um, because there was a single provider who, who just could not see what was wrong with him. 
Uh, next slide, please. You know, and I should add these, all of these recommendations that I'm making, I am trying to have things that have really very little cost, like a rapid response team. It is, you know, you, it, it's an additional duty for people who exist. Um, there are costs, sure, but they don't have to be um, extensive. And so the next one is um, a full disclosure program. The CANDOR program is the one most widely used in the US. It's um, learning from error and from and healing, trying to help people who have suffered from error. So it has these seven components, you know, rapid investigation, not waiting 30 days, right then, as soon as it happens, constant communication with the family, telling them what you know, um, not prematurely, um, because you don't want to send people down wrong paths, but telling them what you do know and keeping them posted on as things turn up. Apologizing, giving them what they need. Um, sometimes people need help with, um, you know, with finances, with lodging, all sorts of things. Uh, it throws everyone's family into chaos. And then reporting, tracking the data, um, educating and training the staff and improving, and above all, which is not on this list and not always done, but disseminating your learnings to other institutions so it doesn't keep happening in other places. That is um, a common failure that I see. Next slide, please. Um, so often after an event, um, Hospitals do a root cause analysis. The problem with root cause analysis is that it is not done sufficiently in depth. It's not an easy thing to do, I recognize that. And it's particularly not easy when it's your colleagues or even yourself. But so it's not done systematically. And the biggest failure, in my opinion, is that patients are seldom included. They're often not even interviewed, usually not even interviewed, meaning that the most important witnesses are not uh, are not consulted. So often, the um, the findings are erroneous. Next slide, please. Um, so I prefer something called an event review, which is simply um, a small dedicated team of people that does not include people who are involved in the event. That's very important. Often the investigation is carried out by the very people who were involved and that leads you down uh, wrong paths very quickly. So you need a dedicated team who's used to doing these, these um, reviews. Uh, they interview everyone individually, not with their supervisor present. So they, they make a point of interviewing the patient and family. And they have three meetings, one, you know, immediately after the event, trying to get organized, then presenting the information and, and reaching consensus as to the cause. Um, and that includes everyone, even if the patient family can't be there, having a patient family representative who can serve as a liaison is important. And then developing an action plan to keep it from recurring. Next slide, please. Um, so, Patient reporting, there's several kinds of patient reporting. One is patient reported outcomes. You may have heard of patient reported outcome measures. Um, they are often sort of clinical um, about, you know, things like how, how well your mobility is progressing after, after your knee surgery. Um, but I particularly like this man, um, Dr. Ethan Bosch in the U.S., who is, is a cancer doctor and oncologist and he has patients report on their, you know, their responses to their chemotherapy, their medications, and adjust their chemotherapy in accordance. Um, he says that clinicians systematically downgrade symptoms compared with patients, which I think is commonly found, and that patients' uh, reports actually correlate better with their functional status, that is, their vital signs and lab reports, than other clinician reports do. Uh, next slide, please. And what he finds is that um, it was not on that slide, but he did a 10 year study of people with terminal cancer diagnoses and he found significantly increased longevity among the patients whose um, 
who had been following this regimen, whose, whose patient reports were part of their treatment. But patients can also report safety concerns and errors and near misses, and they report a lot of things that are not included in the normal methods we use for reporting, sometimes things that are not even in their own medical record. Um, and this is almost every study that's ever been done of this finds that patients report more things than are, than are re reported elsewhere. And that doesn't need to be taken negatively. I mean, one study that I'm currently involved in, it, it, sh it flags things like equipment failures on a particular unit, um, some problems and processes for certain kinds of medication. The patient reports can get very granular and can really help improve the process. Next slide, please. Um, number of ways to get feedback. You know, you can you can do it as part of the discharge process. You can survey the patient after they've gone home. Um, there are surveys available from HRQ and from the Picker Institute in Europe. Um, patient experience survey is very effective. Um, the patient can be shadowed, random patients from time to time, just to see what their process is, what they are experiencing. That's really quite an eye-opening um, intervention. You can interview them, uh, and then you can just survey the general public. Everyone has healthcare expenses experiences. Next slide, please. Um, the Saudi Patient Safety Center has done a really excellent job of um, outreach, of really forming a good program for for patient empowerment. I would in engagement and co-production. I would urge you to visit their website. Um, they they reach out into the community. They um, have patients engaged in various different things. Next slide, please. Um, especially, I want to focus on the patient and family advisory councils. These are incredibly useful. Um, they should be focused on safety and quality. There are a number of things patients and families can advise on, but safety and quality is where they have critical information that nobody else has. So they can um, help you, you know, create a partnership. They can serve as a liaison to the community. Um, they can work on issues. They can make recommendations. Um, they can talk to patients. It's, it's a huge benefit to have a patient family advisory council. Next slide, please. Um, again, that's just, you know, some of the things that they can do. Um, next slide, please. I think I already said this. Um, so patients, we can learn together. You know, they're the only continuous thread in the hospital. They are the most interested in improving their care and finding out you know, what, go, what went wrong and what can go right. They bring the eyes of, they bring fresh eyes. You know, there are people who come from all walks of life and who know what works in other places. Um, they have really helpful information to share. Next slide, please. So this is my final slide. Don Berwick, who is our patient safety guru in the U.S., says, Putting patients first is the best guarantee of a sustainable healthcare delivery system. And I think that is absolutely right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. I think um, we're going to just uh, have some polls. So if you can just read them, then we can uh, ask our participant to interact with the coming three questions from your side. To test their okay. understanding. Yes. Um, Go ahead. Our okay. IT can, yeah. Our IT, can you help us with the first poll, please? Yes, please. And um, you know, given the time, maybe we should just do the first poll and let Hussein start. Um, which of the following strategies um, help empower patients to keep themselves safe? Um, so A, B, and C, A, C, and D, B, C, and D, or all of the above.
So our participant, we are encouraging you to participate in the polls. Um, some some of the participants are uh, participating through the chat, so we are encouraging you to participate through polls. We can see the per percentage of each group. So um, 88 of our participants, they think it's all of the above. And they are right. <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay, thank you. We got people, it. <laughs> people were listening. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I think we should skip the next two questions and let Hussein get started. Um, okay. Okay, we can skip it and we will go um, with the other uh, speaker, Mr. Hussein. Are you with us? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Helen highlighted the clinical side of patient, uh, you know, engagement and empowerment. And I'll be basically talking about uh, patient advocates experience, how they navigate their way into the health system. And since our focus on this uh, webinar is on low and middle income countries, I'll give you my own example because I am from Pakistan. So I'll let you know what my journey has been. So next slide, please. So uh, sustained patient safety uh, and empowerment require collaboration among patients, healthcare professionals and healthcare institutions. When patients are encouraged to actively pa uh, participate in their treatment and transparent communication is provided, healthcare systems can significantly improve patient safety and elevate the overall quality of healthcare. Next, please. So let us uh, remind ourselves of the Almata Declaration way back in 1978 when all the countries of the world got together and they drafted the Almata Declaration. Um, the declaration states that the people have the right and duty to participate individually and collectively in the planning and implementation of their health care. But, but to fulfill this condition, the patients need to be empowered and, and, and engaged. If people are patients are not engaged and, in, and not empowered, they cannot simply cannot participate in their own health care. Next, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So patient empowerment is a multifaceted process that involves actions and strategies at the individual, organizational and policy levels. And, and we at, at all of these levels can play our part to improve the situation. So, for example, at the individual level, the healthcare provider could educate patients and, and, and work towards capacity building of their his or her, her patient. They can encourage shared decision, decision making with the patient, and they can also support in self management of uh, diseases. At the organization level, uh, the organization can, you know, uh, they need to embed patient centered care as a core value within the organization. They can also work towards you know, establishment and encouraging patient advocates roles uh, within their own organization. And they can also ensure environment of trust and transparency uh, in the organization. And at the policy level, the policy level, you know, the policy makers need to develop leg legislation and regulations on patient rights and ensure their enforcement. They can in initiate patient education. In, uh, can you go back? Sorry. Yeah. So, so the policymakers could also initiate patient education initiatives so that patients are engaged in the health system, and and they can also work towards the implementation of patient-centered healthcare policies, and also uh, they can develop uh, policies for health information, uh, you know, access. So there's a lot many things that you know we at different levels can do for patient empowerment and engagement. Next, please. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting with my own uh, journey um, as, as a raw person, you know, who, is, who hasn't hadn't got 
any medical background. So I started off working as a, as a genetic counselor for a genetic disease called thalassemia. And to my surprise, I was the first person ever who was talking to these families about what was wrong with their children, what was needed to be done, because nobody had ever before you know, talk to them and they were just provided treatment and that's it. And and the this overall condition of the patients was pretty bad because they didn't know, you know, what the treatment they were given was good or not. And then, you know, uh, my own, uh, in the meanwhile, my own grandfather, he started, he developed dementia and, and, and he could not be diagnosed by, by, by the doctor. So it took more than two years to get a diagnosis. So my grandfather, my family, we suffered a lot because of you know inavailability of the diagnosis and that actually led me to found alzheimer's pakistan and, and, and help other patients and caregivers and i in the meanwhile you know while going through this journey i i in, informally started working as an advocate and, and working towards patient-centered healthcare without realizing you know that i was working towards patient-centered healthcare i started this work and then my work gradually, you know, improved, increased, and, and I move at the international forums as well. Next, please. So I was very fortunate that I got uh, selected to be among the 21 patients who was selected to participate in the first ever patients, WHO's Patients for Patient Safety Workshop that was, uh, you know, organized in 2005 in London. So we all patients, different patient advocates from different parts of the world, we all sat together, we discussed what the problems have been and, and how can we as patient advocates work together to improve the situation globally. And we also drafted the London Declaration during that meeting. Next, please. <clears throat> so I, I learned, uh, you know, uh, during that meeting that, you know, we can advocate as patient advocate, we can advocate to raise uh, political will to take action and implement appropriate patient safety strategies and partner with other healthcare providers to develop solutions um, in, in the health system. We also learned that, you know, we can educate and train, um, you know, patient groups to make an informed contribution to patient safety so that, you know, there are more and more people who get training and education uh, for for empowerment, not only for empowerment, but for engagement as well. And we can also work toward raising awareness on patient safety issues with the public and the media. Next, please. How, when I came back to Pakistan, uh, you know, it was like falling from the moon to the earth. You know, things were very different. You know, things were very, very tough in the country. And, and I was totally lost. I didn't know what to do and where to start. So this was a big dilemma for me to where to start, you know, whatever I have discussed, whatever we have, you know, wanting to do um, and globally, how can that I implement in my own country? Next, please. <clears throat> so it took me uh, a while, you know, uh, before I, I could figure out what I could do, but but you know there was uh, there were a lot of problems as i said you know there was no recognition of patient advocate they, i think this word did not, did not did not even exist at that time patient advocate you know so so the doctors the healthcare providers were you know they were just providing treatment to patients who were coming there they were there there was nothing else you know that they could uh, relate to or understand i didn't know from where to start what to do I didn't have the advocacy skill that are required. And then the patients also fear, uh, or they also have this fear of victimization that if I speak up, then I might be victimized by the, by the system. Next, please. <clears throat> so as I said, you know, it took me a while before I figure out, you know, how can I really make things work? I realize I just can never, you know, on my own make a change into the system. I need to do is I need to collaborate and I need to, uh, you know, partner with with other people and not only with with patients but with other healthcare stakeholders that included doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, media, lawyers, government, WHO. Everybody needs to be on board to bring about uh, a change um, in 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 the health sector. Next, please. 
yeah so uh, it took me some time but you know uh, in in about 2007 i i i was lucky to meet uh, go and meet uh, a wonderful lady a doctor she was the president of the pakistan medical association i i went there and i talked to her and i talked about the plight of patients um, and and she you know heard me and she said well, uh, i i i am totally you know uh, in accordance with you you are right uh, things uh, are need to be improved so she she was the first partner that i had and both of us worked towards developing a bigger group so so we 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 developed uh, established pakistan patient safety network and we included people from all walks of life and the first meeting also happened in the office of the pakistan medical association next please so that was uh, basically the turning point you know where when i you know had this this uh, alliance and this network and this partnership happened and then you know we started as a group started working toward educating other patients we started conducting national level workshop for patients to tell them what patient centered healthcare is and how can they contribute to, towards their own health and how can we improve the quality and safety of healthcare so these are the workshops where we we were educating these patients about you know their rights and patient centered healthcare next please So it was not only the patients that we talked with, you know, we also through Pakistan Medical Association started running campaigns in different hospitals. So, so we would go into hospitals, we would, you know, collect all the healthcare providers in the hospital, and then we can introduce them with, with the concepts like, you know, patient-centered healthcare and, and, and rights and, and patient issues. And, and, and I'm, I must tell you that, you know, some of these terms, some of these concepts were new to most of these healthcare providers. But, but you know, one thing was sure, for sure that at the end of these sessions, those, doc those doctors had a different perspective altogether about how they can work with patients and how can they involve patients. So very, very effective and very successful campaign. Next, please. Uh, this is another very important uh, project that we run. So we started, uh, we realized that, you know, there were deficiencies in the training of doctors. So doctors were basically trained in, in clinical skills, but they were lacking other skills, you know, like communication skills and, and, and you know, uh, leadership skills, management skills, and which were, you know, also playing a big role in their, for, you know, in their being effective in, in treating patients and in communicating with patients. So uh, with the help of the World Health Organization and with the help of the Global Health Workforce Alliance, we, we, we came up with this initiative in which we involved three medical schools from Pakistan that included King, King Edward Medical University, Fatma Jinnah Medical University, and Alama Iqbal Medical College. So we did a survey of the doctors there, young doctors, and, and on the basis of that survey, you know, a certain sort of uh, skill sets were identified that these were lacking in our in our in our young doctors. So our curriculum was developed, and then you know we've trained master trainers from these uh, these institutions on those on that curriculum, and then these master trainers went back to their institution and started delivering this new syllabus that was developed. And I must tell you that after you know once the uh, the young, so it was basically delivered to the young doctors and is also to the final year uh, of the medical school. So the 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 new generation that were coming up uh, through this uh, through this curriculum was a totally changed um, you know uh, um, uh, generation. They were talking with patients and they were you know they were so visibly uh, improved um, you know improvements in the hospital that these these programs were then you know then were permanently implemented next please uh, apart from that we also you know work towards um, awareness advocacy so this is one of the ideas we we decided to do something different so that people can sit back and see you know what we are talking about and so this was a, a collaborative track um, we did with the patient safety foundation uh, poland and and we tracked to the base camp of nanga parbat which is one of the highest mountains in the world um you know over our 8000 meters and and a lot of media coverage that we got out of this and a lot of good publicity for the cause of patient safety in the country as well next please 
Um, we as a group also thought that we need to have some goodwill among the community as well. So what we did was that, you know, in, in San Sir Gangaram Hospital, which is a big hospital in Lahore um, that has about over 1000 bed strength, uh, the government had stopped providing food there. So we as a group, uh, you know, decided that we will generate funds and we will provide this food. So for the last 15 years, you know, we are now providing breakfast and lunch to over 1,000 patients um, in the hospital. So that has tremendously enhanced our goodwill, um, uh, not only among the community, but also amongst the policymakers. So they have started listening to us what we've got to say. Next, please. Uh, apart from that, you know, we our, our group is also very actively involved uh, in, in organizing medical camps. So whenever there is any emergency situation, uh, natural calamity, earthquake, floods, or anything of that sort happening in the country, we organize uh, medical camps. You know, in these far flung, far flung areas, and we have so far seen and provided medicine to more than 150 uh, thousand patients uh, during these camps. Next, please. So that was just a very brief snapshot of how I started work. Uh, working uh, as a patient advocate, how I made a team, and how you know, in different different, uh, you know, we we catered to, to the different aspects of the healthcare, you know, uh, um, system. Um, now moving on to my journey, for example, to the World Health Organization. Um, you may know that WHO has a, a patient safety program. Next, please. So in, in 2002, the, uh, during the World Health Assembly, all the countries of the world got together and, and, and a resolution was passed that basically you know, urged member states to pay the closest possible attention to patient safety. So on the basis of this resolution in 2004, the, the World Health Organization uh, developed a WHO patient safety program that basically uh, aims to coordinate, disseminate, and ex accelerate improvements in patient safety worldwide. So following that, uh, the World Health Organization established a group, Patients for Patient Safety. So these are patient, basically patient advocates, leading patient advocates from different parts of the world. They were brought together so that they can provide their input into all the work that World Health Organization is doing. Next, please. So we now have over 5,000 strong patient for patient safety. We call them champions all over the world, and they are very actively involved in their health systems at the national and local levels and trying to bring about a, a positive change in patient safety and quality uh, conditions uh, in, in those areas. Next, please. Um, yeah, so you may also know that uh, the World Health Organization in 2021 has come up with a global patient safety action plan. So WHO wants that this action plan is implemented by every country in the world so that, you know, the, 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 the overall condition of patient safety and quality improves globally in each country. Next, please. So, so this, uh, this action plan has nine uh, strategic objectives. I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide, but these are nine strategic objectives on, on the left-hand side. And, and, and one of these uh, objectives is the, is the strategic objective four, which, which basically talks about patient and family engagement. So we basically, it says, you know, engage and empower patients and families to help and support the journey to safer healthcare. Next, please. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, this this strategic objective, basically, you know, the the action plan also highlights that the patient engagement and empowerment is perhaps the most powerful tool to improve patient safety. So, so this means that no matter what you do, no matter no matter how developed, or how good health system you have, until and unless you do not engage and empower patients in your work, you cannot really improve patient safety. Next, please. So this strategic objective for basically, you know, has uh, five action areas. So all the countries in the world have to, you know, focus on these areas as well and implement action plans according to them. So I'll just go through briefly uh, through them so that you understand what this 
uh, strategic objective basically says so the 4.1 says engage patients families and civil society organization in co development of policies plans and strategies programs and guidelines so whatever policy you develop patients and families need to be engaged at right at the policy level then 4.2 says learn from the experience of patient and families exposed to unsafe care to improve the understanding and nature of harm and foster the development of most effective solutions so as helen said you know there has not been real learning from uh, from what the from the adverse events those events are not even recorded properly then the third uh, uh, part says build the capacity of patient advocates and champions um, in patient safety so you need to improve and, and and build the capacity of patients as well so that they can really contribute constructively in this debate 4.4 says establish the principle and practice of openness and, and transparency throughout the healthcare including through patient safety incidents disclosure to patients and families and last one says provide information and education to patients and families for their involvement in uh, self care and empower them for shared decision making so this again talking about education and empowerment for shared decision making next please uh, I, I'll now very briefly tell you about another very uh, important uh, global organization is called World Patient Alliance. Next, please. It is the largest umbrella patient organization. Uh, next, please. Hello. Next, please. Yeah, this is the largest umbrella patient organization. Uh, you know, that comprises of patient organizations at different countries level. So, you know, the green color shows where they have their members. It's in, in more than 120 countries of the world. Um, and they, they provide that platform to empower patients' voice so that, you know, so that other stakeholders can also collaborate, work uh, with patients at the global, regional, and country levels. Next, please. Um, these are the nine principles on which World Patients Alliance works. So they basically talk about access to healthcare. There needs to be access to healthcare for all populations. Uh, the, the health system must be patient-centered. There should be no financial hardship, none whatsoever. Patients must be empowered. They must be educated. They must be collaborated with. They must be engaged. Uh, the 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 healthcare that's provided should be of safe and uh, of good quality, and there should not be any discrimination, none whatsoever, in seeking healthcare anywhere in the world. Next, please. Um, how are we doing with the time, uh, Makia? Makia? Yeah, uh, I think we have a flexible time that you can finish your presentation. Okay. All right. So, so you know, this is uh, and this is also from the World Patient Alliance. It's the Patient Safety Bill of Rights. Um, you can get uh, more information on that on on our on on the website of World Patient Alliance. That's www.worldpatientsalliance.org. So, uh, I'm not going to go into this because I I know you know we are getting a bit late. But but next, please. So you can get more information on the website. Um, this is also about one of their flagship uh, uh, projects. Um, they organize World Patient Safety Day that I'm sure you all know about. It's on 17th of September every year. In the last two years, the World Patient Alliance has conducted more than 1,200 events globally through their member organizations. These are the largest uh, patient safety campaigns. So it's just not at the global level, but they are working right at the grassroots level where the actual patients are through their members. Next, please. So, so they every year they organize different events during the World Patient Safety Day. You can look and look at these pictures. You know, these include walks and these include conferences for patients and these include meetings and these include dramas. You know, highlighting, for example, the danger signs of pregnancy and when and you know uh, how the the mothers should uh, seek help in case of any any emergency next please 
and then you know there there are more pictures you can the picture on the left top is is a sports festival where the youth uh, are informed about medication safety so that they can go back and mobilize the community and inform them about how to take medicines uh, you know safely similarly a similar campaign being run in uganda um, in in a school where school children are told about Uh, medication safety and how can they ensure that everybody in the family you know when they are taking medicines they are safe to be taken next please um that's i'm just now finishing that's uh, uh, one of the uh, you know conferences uh, meetings that's coming up for the world patient alliance so you can register for this conference and this meeting it's going to be in 4th to 5th of uh november in dubai so please do uh, visit the website and and register yourself next please so that's my last slide so basically in conclusion the worldwide pressure on healthcare system represents an imminent issue demanding immediate remedies effective patient empowerment and involvement should form the core of endeavors to reorient healthcare system towards individuals and patients patients and and advocacy groups are assuming a central role in reshaping and shaping healthcare systems to ensure the provision of top notch safe and appropriate healthcare for all individuals and through the empowerment of patients to actively engage in their healthcare and the promotion of transparent communication healthcare systems can markedly elevate patient safety and and advance the overall quality of healthcare systems uh, thank you very much for your patience listening Thank you very much, our um, speakers, Mr. Helen, uh, Mrs. Mm-hmm. Helen, and Mr. Hussein. Uh, actually, we're addressing a very interesting topics for um, our attendees. They are above thirty mm-hmm. hundred. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, I have uh, two questions for both of you before uh, closing. I know we we run out of our time, but let's just share um, some uh, questions mm-hmm. for you. Um, I'm going to start with Helen. Uh, Helen, you have shared with us how patient can see the big picture of how well the system operates, yet still some hospital use paternalistic approach. What is your first recommendation for those hospital if they are ready to start engagement? You know, I, ha- I have thought about this. I think that um, in, in the U.S., first of all, the um, pivotal intervention, in my opinion, was the use of patient experience surveys. Um, People don't often think about that, but it really changed the the power dynamic between patients and providers of all sorts, you know, from nursing assistants to nurses um, to doctors, that um, once people knew that they were going to be rated on their behavior, behavior rapidly improved. Um, so that was one point. One thing: bedside providers um, became much, um, much more attentive to patients. And the other thing I think is that what patients often really want, so many of them, is information, a way to um, to understand what's going on. So basically, just um, Providing information, whether it's written information or teaching providers to communicate better, just having um, patients have a basic understanding of what's going on with their health care is, is hugely important. And again, it, it changes the way that they can interact and contribute. People can't contribute if they're not, um, if they don't know what's going on. So that would be my two first, first suggestions. Thank you. Thank you for enlightening us. Actually, we have a good uh, data from patient experience survey, so let's utilize it very well. <laughs> Thank you for your insight. Uh, for you, Hussein, uh, we see your efforts in supporting patient safety as an advocate. What's your advice to integrate and collaborate with healthcare system in terms of patient safety? Yeah, I think there are a number of ways uh, uh, the patient advocates really collaborate. Uh, can collaborate and do collaborate with with health systems. So one is I think they can serve on different committees. So patient advocates can participate 
in important safety and quality improvement initiatives within the healthcare system. They, they can be part of uh, hospital committees and, and health system committees and provide an input on measures to enhance the quality and safety of care. Apart from that, you know, patient advocates can collaborate uh, with healthcare system to identify areas where policies and processes can be improved to enhance the patient experience. They can provide valuable feedback on the system uh, wide issues. Um, they can help uh, with the capacity building of not only patients, but also the healthcare providers. So they can they can help you know, build the capacity of the healthcare providers as well on how they can work with, with patients. They can also advocate towards uh, promoting patient-centered healthcare within the healthcare systems. Um, they can be the, the bridge between patients uh, and and the uh, and the health systems, you know, they can be the intermediaries between patients and the healthcare providers. They listen to patients' concern and complaints, and investigate issues, and work with the health systems to resolve problems. So there uh, is a number of different ways through which patients can collaborate with system, and they are already doing it in in many of the places. Over. That's great. Um, also, for our non-governmental organization to think about it. Um, actually, uh, we run out of time, and uh, we would like to thank you, our speakers, for your time during preparation and today and every day thinking of this presentation. Actually, um, we are always uh, thankful for our participants who were interacting with our chat today. Thank you, you all, and uh, we are promising you to uh, stay tuned for our upcoming webinars for the World Patient Safety Day and the interesting topics. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you and goodbye.